Yeah, this is week three of our collection on the book of Philippians. And we're preaching together. Yes, I love it. I've been looking forward to it. I don't know if you've been looking forward to it. I feel like when we preach together, it really challenges our marriage. I look, it does, it's the truth. It does challenge our marriage. But once we get to this point where we actually get to You're share back in love with me. what we've prepared, I'm in a state of peace. Well, I want to pastor you today. I love you. You wore the right suit. You look great. I can't wait to, I can't wait to preach with you. I can't wait. I cannot wait. I can't wait to hear what you have to say today. I'm actually okay. looking forward to it. Book of Philippians, Walt. Uh, we've been reading through Philippians, and I hope that you have started. If you haven't, it's not too late. We're on week three, and this collection is called The Art of Joy. Can you say that with me? The Art of Joy. And today we want to talk to you on an entire chapter. It's the second chapter of Philippians. This is a short book, only four chapters in the book of Philippians. But we we want to talk to you today together on the thought, forget yourself. Why don't you look at your neighbor and just say, forget you. (laughs) I'm just playing. I'm just playing. But seriously, if you read the book of Philippians, you're going to be amazed because throughout the book of Philippians, Paul says again and again, rejoice, and he talks about this discipline of joy. In fact, 16 times in this short book, he talks about rejoicing and joy. And how many of you know that happiness and joy are two completely different things, right? So happiness is a feeling. Joy is a choice. We choose joy, and it's actually a discipline as Christ followers that we learn to exhibit in a character of our lives that marks us as we follow Jesus. And I think the really incredible thing about this book and about the fact that Paul is telling us, be joyful, and that he's saying, hey, you need to rejoice, is where he's writing this book from, because he's writing this book from a prison. So while he's in shackles, He's actually like exhorting and encouraging others when he should be the one that needs the encouragement, but he's found that as he speaks of joy that we have in Christ, of salvation and the Holy Spirit with us, that it gives him the strength he needs right there in the prison cell to fight the good fight of faith. And I think it really speaks to us today that whatever you're going through, whatever you're going through, mountaintop, valley, there is joy for your journey. And uh, I think it's something that we have to learn to practice, especially in tough times. Well, I think that joy is this thing that if we don't learn to practice it, you probably won't last on the Christian journey. You ever notice that sometimes people like on the Christian journey, they think that you just have to be like miserable to be holy. Yeah. And I just think the opposite is true. The scripture says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And in order for you to last, in order for you to be strong, you have to actually learn to practice joy. Someone say practice joy. Practice joy. And the apostle Paul is practicing joy from a prison cell. He's saying, you know what? This circumstance, this challenge, these chains are not going to steal my joy. Now, I have never, ever um, been in a prison cell, but I have recently taken a red-eye flight from Seattle to Miami with a four-year-old and a two-year-old by myself. (laughs) Just want to let you know, I'm a great dad. You're a great dad. I I opted out of that. Yeah, Don Tree was nowhere to be found. Um, (laughs) No, just just recently, this past week, my my grandmother, who's 96 years of age, um, she got COVID. Praise God, I bring back a good report that she is okay. Yeah, come on, we can thank God for that. She's, She's okay. I had dinner with her on Thursday in Tacoma, Washington, but I just felt led by the Lord. Honestly, like last week, like at the last minute, I need to go to see my grandmother and I decided I'm gonna take both Wyatt and Wild. It's it's crazy. And um, no help, no wife. She was preparing to preach and um, I'm kidding, sorry. Tough crowd, they really like you. Okay, um, (laughs) take that joke back. Wow, okay, don't come at Don Shree, Rich. We get it, okay. Thanks, guys. And so um, I, I flew to Washington, and we had a great time, but I took a red eye home. Now, let me just tell you, you have not lived until you've taken a red eye flight with a four-year-old and a two-year-old. Um, wow. It's living. Yeah, that was, that was an experience. And um, to, be, to be honest with you, my, my boys, you know, they're saved. They actually did a good job. Um, <laughs> it was the heathen children behind me. Um, I was, uh, 
I was on the flight and, and truly, I don't know, it's like four in the morning in my body and both of my boys are asleep on me and it's just uncomfortable. I can't, I can't sleep. But genuinely, as I'm sitting there, I'm kind of like, you know, I'm thinking about myself. This is uncomfortable. This is like, I just, just want to get there. And as I'm having these thoughts, I'm reminded of what we've been studying as a church. I said, wait a minute, Rich, you have to practice joy. And right there in that moment with my boys on my laps, I just started practicing joy. I just started getting thankful for my sons, thankful for my life. And how many of y'all know, not only did my mood change, but my mindset changed. And it was right around that moment that all of a sudden these two kids behind me, I don't know who they are, but they started doing crazy stuff. It was like slightly demonic manifestation. Um, <laughs> These kids are hitting my chair, ah, hitting my chair. And right as I'm in the middle of this joy, it's like there's something coming to rob my joy. And it's these two seven-year-old kids and a mother that I'm going, what, what, why is she not taking control of this situation? And as these kids are hitting my chair and screaming for the next hour, I, I'm about to lose my joy again. But then I'm reminded, wait a minute, remember what Paul did from the prison cell? He didn't just practice joy, he prayed with joy. So guess what I started doing? I started praying for those two seven-year-olds. Come on. I said, Lord, I don't know their story, but you do, God. <laughs> Lord, I don't know that mother, but you know that mom. Touch her right now in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Someone would say, forget yourself. forget yourself. As you take the focus off of you, as you practice joy, as you pray with joy, well, guess what? I, I made the flight. I'm here to tell about it. You're going to find yourself lasting. You're going to find yourself getting strong for the journey that's ahead. Yeah, and reality is, is that things get in the way of our joy. It, it, would be, it wouldn't be true if any of us said we don't ever struggle with this choice of joy. And maybe today you don't have literal chains like Paul, but I would bet that we could talk today about some opposition in your life about some struggles that you're facing, about some struggles that we're facing. And when it comes to things that oppose our joy, how many of you know, a lot of times it's people, that we've got people problems, that relationships get sticky and it's hard to choose joy in a relationship, whether it's your spouse or your kids or your friends or your family or your coworkers or your boss and maybe someone who lives in your building. You know, I don't know who it is that comes in between you and choosing joy, but I know that oftentimes it's people that we struggle with. And when we look at Paul, Paul was no different. Paul was attacked on every side. We look at the government, the government was trying to always attack Paul. We look at friends who walked with him through seasons and then walked away from him and turned their back on him. We see as other believers misunderstood the message that he was carrying, but he chose again and again to forget himself and to choose joy, to walk in humility. And I really think when we talk about how did Paul decide to choose joy, even despite all this opposition, not knowing who to trust, not knowing who to lean on, even in a prison cell saying, rejoice, how did he do it? Well, I really believe that he found that the secret was to forget himself, was to choose humility, was to not focus on what he was walking through, but who was walking with him through it. And so today we're gonna look to the second chapter of Philippians for this, this discipline as a believer of humility. And we believe that it's gonna lead you to forget yourself and to discover joy for the journey. And what is this word humility? You know, all of us have different definitions, but the actual definition is a modest or low view of one's importance. And I love the famous quote by Rick Warren that humility is not thinking less of yourself but it's thinking of yourself less often. I think there's a big difference between the two. Well, I like both of those definitions. And once again, I think that many of us, maybe you've been around church or you've been in Christian community for a while, maybe you've heard this word before. And I think sometimes as we look at the definitions, it still kind of leaves us in a vague place about how do I practice humility? What does it look like in 2022 to be a person who walks in humility? And you, you got to realize that as Paul's writing this, this is completely uh, an opposing practice to the Roman Empire that he's writing to at that time. In fact, they didn't look at humility as strength. They looked at it like weakness. And I think as Paul writes, 
as you study all of chapter two, which we're just gonna be in the first 18 verses, what you'll discover is that he uses a concept of teaching where he wants to give you an example of humility. In fact, the outline of Philippians chapter two could be four different examples of what he's showing you what it looks like. How many of y'all know that sometimes you have to see something before you can be it? Yeah. The reason why some of us in this room can't have a healthy marriage is because you never saw a healthy marriage. Some of you, you don't really know how to parent your kids because you didn't have a parent that did it for you. Some of us, we never were able to figure out how to walk out the Christian journey with joy and go the distance because we never had a model or an example. That's why the Apostle Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And so what the Apostle Paul does in Philippians chapter two is he gives you four visual aids. He starts with Christ, which is what we're gonna really look at today. He then actually points to himself. How many of y'all know you gotta be um, real confident in Christ to use yourself as the example for humility. Um, He then talks about Timothy, who really was his disciple. And then the last one, which you'll see this name show up, you've already already seen it in your reading, is this name Epaphrodites, which was a man who brought a gift to Paul in prison. And then the church in Philippi started getting upset because he hadn't come back uh, from being in the prison with Paul. He was with Paul, he got sick with Paul, and he just kept ministering to Paul. And they're like, yo, dude, you're tardy, you gotta come back. And Paul uses him as an example of humility. And today, my hope is that you would get a revelation over the next 30 minutes that in order for you to get joy, which leads to your strength, you're gonna have to choose the path of humility. And to define humility, it's just forget yourself. But just like this Roman culture saw humility as weakness, not as strength, I think the American culture today looks at humility not as a strength, but as a weakness. I actually know this not just from my own kind of just observation, but research shows us quite clearly that over the last 100 years here in this nation, we have moved from a culture that taught us to be humble to one that is self-absorbed. I read a book not too long ago by David Brooks, and I believe it's titled um, The Road to Character. It's not a Christian book, but he, he just talks about this idea of humility and he backs it up with so much data. Uh, For instance, in 1950, they asked a group of high school students, um, how many of you view yourself as a very important person? Uh, When they did the study, Gallup came back and said that only 12% of the class said that they thought of themselves as a very important person. What's amazing is that in 2005, they asked the exact same question and the entire group of high schoolers, it was 80% who believed they were a very important person. Now, friend, come on, I know that we are all important because we are all made in the image of God, but there is a teaching that has crept into our society that is self-glorifying. It's self-absorbed. It is, in many ways, humanistic in nature. It's a philosophy that's creeping in that puts you at the center of everything. Um, Psychologists, they have this uh, test. It's called the narcissism test. It's really, really interesting. Um, They go through a a series of statements and then they ask if those statements apply to you. And some of the statements could be things like, um, I like to be the center of attention. Um, I show off if I get the chance because I am extraordinary. Um, Somebody should write a a biography on me. (laughs) Watch this. The median narcissism score has risen 30% in the last two decades. 93% of young people score higher than the median score just 20 years ago. What's crazy is that they study this as self-esteem has allegedly increased in our nation. With it also, the desire for fame has come with it. So this, this is fascinating. What they did is in 1976, there was a survey done and it asked uh, people if a life goal, what their life goals were. Fame scored number 15 out of 16 items. But when you cross-reference that with simply um, in 2007, they did the exact same question. And in 2007, 51% of young people reported that being famous was one of their life's top personal goals. They asked a group of, of high school girls who they most wanted to meet. Number one, Jennifer Lopez. Number two, Jesus Christ. And number three, Paris Hilton. (laughs) In that same study, they asked them if they could choose between two different jobs. Watch this. This is crazy. They could choose between two different jobs. 
Twice as many said that they would rather be a celebrity's assistant instead of the president of Harvard. So what I'm just trying to get you to see culturally is that we are inundated with this idea of self. And as I get obsessed with self, I get obsessed with what other people think about me and I wanna be famous, I wanna be around fame, and I think that if I'm famous, I think that if I'm very important, then somehow that will make me happier. But come on, you don't need a psychologist to come here today and tell you that we have every bit of data to show that we are not becoming happier. We as a nation are becoming more depressed, we're becoming more anxious, we don't have peace, Come on, how many believe that as I put myself at the center, I don't find joy, instead I find heartache and I find pain. It's only when Jesus is brought to the center and I forget myself that I find the life that I'm looking for. And so I really believe today that as we look at what Paul writes, he's gonna write completely in chapter two all about humility and it's his humility that leads to joy. Let's pick up today in Philippians chapter two. We're just carrying on in our study. Let's look at verse one. Dontree, why don't you read Philippians chapter two, verse one. It says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, Count others more significant than yourselves. Verse four says, let each of you not look only to his own interests, but watch this, but also to the interests of others. Now, as we start this, I love to read the Bible. And as we go through the verses, I love to let the verses preach their own message. If you're in the room today, if you're watching online, maybe you're going, okay, cool. Maybe I can start to believe that humility is the pathway to happiness, aka joy, but how do I even get humility? Like, I saw the definition, I, I believe the research that we're not becoming more people of peace or people of joy. I believe that we're depressed. I believe that we're anxious. I believe that suicide is on the rise. How do I actually get humility? Well, as Paul starts writing right here, he gives you the answer. And it's simply this, is that real humility is a response to God's radical love. It's great. You have to start there every time as a believer that if you want to walk the humble path, you don't do it through your own effort. Look at what he's saying. He says, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from his love, any participation in the spirit. So what is he doing? He's starting with the initial pursuit of Jesus towards you. That you yourself, you can't just result and just become humble. No, you have to receive God's radical love. God's radical love results in you walking the humble path. I can't just will myself into forgetting about me. The only way I can forget about me is when I remember what Jesus has already done for me. Okay. You don't get humble in your own effort. You become humble in focusing on his effort. Great. That's what the apostle Paul is saying right here in the very beginning. How do I get this humility? By receiving God's radical love. I don't even know what love is. Oh, wait a minute. He first loved me. I have to receive in order to respond. Humility is a response to the love of God Paul's going to lay out for us marks of humility, but I just think for every one of us, Don Cherie, in order for us to even begin the journey, we have to receive that over and over and over. Yeah, I think it's a daily decision, right? A daily decision to walk with Jesus, to respond to the Spirit, to lean into the Scriptures, and we're, we're shaped in His image every single day. What, not as we blaze our own trail, not as we come up with our own message or reason to live, that's not the gospel. The gospel is that day after day, you and I get to respond to his love. And so that's what humility is. But what are the marks of humility? Uh, today, we wanna just drill this down and really uh, get practical with what humility looks like. And the first thing that we wanna focus on is that humility is not grasping. It is emptying. Humility is not reaching. It is not grasping. It is emptying. And I think when we think of humility, 
oftentimes there's this word thrown around, false humility. And if you are just concerned that other people think that you are humble, that's called false humility. You are focusing on yourself. It is thinly veiled pride. Um, Humility is not false humility. That's not what it actually is. And I think when it comes to great leaders, leaders who lead for the sake of others, you meet great leaders and you realize that they are unimpressed with themselves. They are not focused on themselves or how they are perceived. They're focused on the needs around them. And any great leader is looking at at short-term and long-term decisions. And I think our short-term needs and our long-term needs in life often seem like they're coming at each other. Like short-term, I know that I need this right now, but long-term, I know I'm supposed to be this day by day, but God doesn't want your short, short-term short needs and your long-term vision to go head to head. He wants us to understand, just like Rich preached last week, that our sacrifices and our surrender and our suffering, that choosing that in the short-term creates long-term impact. Mm. And when it comes to humility, well, humility is deciding to trust God day by day and not to seek to prove our own worth, but rather to empty out what is inside of us for the sake of others. Come on, if you believe that today, why don't we put our hands together? I'm not not grasping. No, I'm choosing to empty. And and our long-term position of humility, it comes from a mindset. And Paul really, he drills in on this mindset in verse two, he says, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. And I love that he says do nothing out of conceit or selfish ambition. Because I think when we just read Webster's definition of humility, it's a good definition, but I don't think it speaks to the totality of a Christian's definition of humility. Because humility, when you just read it, a definition in, in Webster's dictionary, it's just speaking to having a low view of oneself. But friends, that's not the totality of humility for a Christ follower. Yeah. Because Paul so clearly says it's not just not focusing on yourself. No, there's another step. It's being outward focused. So you can say, oh, I'm humble. You know, I, no, I don't think much of myself. I'm not grasping for the attention. I'm not seeking the limelight. But the second question for the Christ follower when it comes to humility is, well, who are you focused on? What are you giving? What are you emptying out? It's not just there's not much that I'm taking, it's what are you giving? That's what humility is for a Christ follower when it comes to Paul. Don't miss out on the power of this Christian attribute, this beautiful characteristic that like Rich said, came to life when people decided to follow Jesus, that it was so countercultural. And why? Not just because they weren't trying to grasp the accolades or the credit, but because Christ followers decide to empty their lives out for the sake of others. And I love that it says in verse four, it says, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Humility is measured by your love for others in action. But then Paul goes on. It just gets better and better. Verse five, he says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Jesus Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. Now, this passage is one of the most rich theological passages in this book. It is deep. You could read and write hundreds of pages on just this paragraph alone that we just read. Because what Paul is saying, he's saying, I'm not just gonna encourage you to not look to your own interests. 
I'm not just gonna say don't ever live selfishly or for your own ambition. I'm gonna drill this down and give you the greatest example of all, the example of Jesus. And Paul speaks to the pre-existence of Jesus, to the incarnation of Jesus, to the crucifixion that we see on Golgotha, and then to Jesus rising to the right hand of the Father as he is resurrected in glory and in power. All of that is found in these few verses. And how does that pertain to you? Because Jesus is the perfect picture of humility. Jesus had every reason to lord over and to take and to grasp, but he did not do that. And Paul is saying, look to the example of Jesus of what humility looks like. He talks about the mindset of Christ. This is more than just the thoughts that are passing through your head. A mindset is much deeper. It's the path of thought that you choose. Mm. Your thoughts are set in a direction. All of our thoughts are set in a direction. And when it comes to the mindset of Christ, we know that he decided to be selfless instead of selfish. Very good. There are two paths every day in conversation, in disagreement, in obstacles. Am I gonna be selfish or am I gonna be selfless? And when we look to the example of Jesus, Paul says a few things that we should pay attention to. It says that he was in the form of God, but he took on the form of a servant. And when we look to the original interpretation of this word, it's the word morphe. And that word simply means to take on the true characteristics of a genuine reality. So Jesus was literally all God and all man. Come on. It was the genuine reality of the God that we serve that he was both at the same time. But Jesus didn't decide to grasp to be all God and not embrace the humanity that his father had clothed him in. Rather, he decided to take on the form of a servant. He decided to serve, why? Because he was walking in humility. But not only that, Scripture goes on to say that though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. This phrase, a thing to be grasped, in the original language is harpagmon, and it literally means to grasp or to reach. So Jesus wasn't reaching to be God. Instead of reaching for greatness, instead of reaching for the credit and the glory, he didn't reach, he emptied himself. Mm. He poured his very life out. And friends, in emptying himself, he showed his equality with God like nothing else could. Because what Paul is trying to reveal to you and me is that we see the glory of Jesus being God and King in the most beautiful display of love that the world has ever seen. Instead of forcing being God, he sacrificed so that we can receive everything that he is. So who do you think the God of the universe is? Do you think that he became God by clawing his way to the top? Do you think that he became God by by shutting every opposing force down? Or could Paul be revealing the deeper nature of the God that we serve? That he is God because he loves perfectly. He is God because he poured his life out for those that could never be free without him, that could never have peace without him. He is God because he is perfect and his love is displayed in the perfect sacrifice that he shed 2,000 years ago, his perfect spotless blood, so that you could claim healing in your blood, in your body through his sacrifice. This is the message of the gospel, that he was not grasping, but he emptied himself. Come on, if you believe it today, can we give God praise? He emptied his life out for us. And so he urges us to take on that same mindset, to take on that same character. 
somebody came to preach today. Um, <laughs> I love it. Uh, I love what you're pointing out, and this, this, as Don Shree just said it in such an eloquent way, this part, this portion of Paul's writing as he's using Christ as the example is poetry. It's some of just great literature as, as writers have looked at it. It's just some of the best writing that the world has ever seen. I encourage you to look at it. And this idea of what humility, a mark of humility is, it's, it's, it's empty and it's, it's not grasping. I can't help but just think about the idea that there's the first Adam and then Paul in Romans says that Jesus is the second Adam. Isn't that a beautiful like cross-reference? How many of y'all know that Adam, what did he do? He grasped and he reached for the fruit why was he reaching the fr- for the fruit? You know the Bible. It's because he was reaching so that he could have God-like status. What did the serpent say? Don't you know if you eat this fruit, you'll be just like God? It was pride in his heart that was reaching out, I'll be happier if I'm like God. I'll be happier if I'm on God's level. I'll be happier and I'll have more peace and more joy if I'm in control, if I know I'm a very important person. But what happens? He eats the fruit and it's the destruction of man. It's called the depravity, man. It's the original sin. You cross-reference the first Adam with the second Adam. The second Adam, he didn't grasp. He, he emptied himself. Yeah. He took on the form of Adam to pay for the price of Adam's sin. And you and I, how do we forget ourselves? We, we forget ourselves by emptying ourselves every day. I can't fill your cup, but I can pour out mine. I can... I can pour out what God's given me to those around me and I can love you and I can serve you and I can forgive you. I wanna be like Jesus. I wanna empty myself. L- let's continue because when Don Shree and I preach together, we always preach way too long, but, um, but it's good preaching. More you, less me. But anyways, here we go. <laughs> Philippians chapter two, verse, uh, we'll start in verse eight. Watch, this is so good. And being found in human form, he, Jesus, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Therefore, watch this, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Verse 11, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The second mark of humility is that humility is not opportunistic, it's obedient. Humility is not looking for the opportunity. Humility is simply following the path that Jesus has called me to. I want to obey you, God, even if that obedience requires me to go to a cross. And more often than not, we ought to just get this as believers in Jesus, more often than not, the great opportunity that you're looking for is on the other side of the cross. That's Jesus' story, right? He goes to a cross, he dies, and it's as he dies, he's buried, then he's resurrected, and then what? Then God lifts him up, and as he's lifted up, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. What I want us as a church to see is why do we think if we avoid suffering, we'll be happier? Why do we organize our lives trying to make sure that we don't encounter pain? Why do we organize our lives going, let me just make sure I don't come near any type of suffering or challenge or opposition. I think if I get away from that stuff, I'll be happier. But friends, you won't be. You're going to miss your God opportunity because your God opportunity is on the other side of you obeying God. That's right. it's, it's obedience. Humility looks like obedience. And I just want to, in this collection, as we're talking about the art of joy, where do I get this joy? Happiness is cheap, but joy is costly. And joy, real joy, is typically found deep down in the valley of pain and suffering. And we as believers, we have to know who we're following. We're following Jesus, the one who willfully gave up his life, that he then might be lifted up. It wasn't until he obeyed that he was truly lifted. You know, I think about our community of people, and man, our our church is full of men and women who embrace suffering, who've embraced pain. And I'm blown away by it, because as I talk to people, and as I hear your testimonies, what you'll discover about people who, who embrace the suffering that's from them, they don't run from it, they don't hide from it, they don't complain about it, they just embrace it. We've got cancer patients who've survived cancer. We have people who've lost loved ones, 
None of that stuff is what we're looking forward to, but rather we face it head on and we walk with Jesus through it and we obey even though it's a cross. And what you discover is that it does not decrease your joy, it deepens your joy. But we live in a world today that will lie to you and tell you the opposite. Roe versus Way was just reversed and there's been a whole lot of conversations around all that stuff and I made some statements a couple of weeks ago about that. But I've just been studying it more and more and one of the things that I found just to be horrifying and just so discouraging is that what we find out is that 67% of mothers who discover that they have a child who has Down syndrome in the womb tends to abort that child. 67% of abortions um, or 67% of mothers who, who find out that they have a Down syndrome child that they abort the baby. Why? Because somewhere on the journey, that mom, that family was told that a child with Down syndrome will decrease their joy, will decrease their happiness, will be an inconvenience, will make life too uncomfortable, too hard, too difficult. But I'm not here to shame anyone. I'm just here to bolster the faith in the room to go, who told you that? Wow, if God gives you a child, and if God gives you a child with down syndrome, oh my God, what a joy, what a beauty. Something tells me that child's gonna teach you more than you could ever, ever be taught from anything in the world. Don't run from it, embrace it. Embrace it because there's, there's joy on the other side. I can speak from my home. We have a, my brother is disabled and I just gotta tell you, it has been difficult and it has been hard, but it has been the deepest joys of our life. We have discovered characters and we have discovered God's nature like never before. Why? Because God, he can't teach you everything about who he is on the mountaintop. He has to take you into the valley of suffering for you to realize that he is the God who walks with you even in the suffering and even in the pain. When we talk about forgetting ourselves, when we talk about this path of humility, you, you can't talk about it and not not challenge people to obey like Christ, even the cross that's before them. For Jesus even said, if you want to find your life, you've got to lose it. That's right. Take up your cross and follow me. Yeah, and I, I love that. I love that we're talking about obedience today because Paul so clearly is challenging us to obey and trust God. But I think oftentimes when we think of obedience, we're just thinking about what we have to do. But friends, there is so much security and peace when you know that you are obeying God. There is joy. If you want real joy, it's not deciding your own journey. It's knowing that you're trusting God and that He is in control and that He is leading your steps. And you may be suffering right now, but just like Paul, you can speak to your spirit and you can say, I, I don't have to just conjure up emotions of happiness. I get to choose joy mm. because I choose to throw my life into the hands of the one who created me, to the one who is leading me. And, you know, as we continue to look to the marks of humility, we're gonna continue to read verse six, verse 12. It says this, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. You know, I, I love the language that Paul speaks here because he speaks as a friend. He speaks as one who loves the body, who loves those that he gets to serve, that even as he's separated, that they're on his heart. And I think that that shines so bright. And so the last mark that we wanna talk of humility is that humility doesn't flash, it shines. It shines. And when we hear Paul admonish the early believers in Philippi, he's saying, hey, work out your salvation. And he's not just talking about like, go in your prayer closet and pray alone. No, he's really speaking corporately to the church at large. He's saying this thing of walking together, of actually being on the same page, of believing and knowing who you are in Christ, it takes work within your community. 
So work it out. Work it out. He says with fear and trembling. And that doesn't mean like being scared to talk to someone or being afraid to have a conversation. It just means, God, I'm in awe that you saved me, you put me in this family. And so I'm gonna let my awe of you and my awareness of your presence and your spirit within me in the day-to-day mundane, give me the strength to work this thing out in the community that I choose to be planted in. In other words, Paul is saying, get on with being God's people. Stop backing away. Stop making excuses. Work this thing out, not just for one bold statement of a flash, but let this thing shine. And how do you shine? You work it out. You work it out. But then he gives you the how, what, the when, the where, and the why for it. And he goes on to say, who? He he tells us who? God empowers us. Good. Why? He empowers us. He empowers it for within us and among us. How many of you know that before the Holy Spirit can work among us, He's gonna work in us? Mm. So in us and among us, when? Through our action, our love and action, but also through our will, just submitting our will. And why? He says, for the good purpose of God. I don't have to know the good purpose of God. He knows the good purpose of God. I just get to choose to trust, obey, surrender, and not walk away. But then he goes on to say this in verse 14. He says, do everything without grumbling or disputing. Will you just say do everything? Do everything. I mean, that really leaves no room for grumbling, which is complaining, or disputing, which means having arguments. So he's speaking to the local church very practically, saying do everything without complaining or disputing. And that's because there were arguments in Philippi. In fact, he speaks to two women in chapter four, Yodia and Sintiki, and he speaks to them and he tells them, hey, you need to go work this thing out. Like it's not worth walking away. You need to work this out. Why is Paul in such a powerful declaration of theology and the overall message of the gospel, taking the time to say something as practical as do everything without complaining and disputing? because he knows the greatest attack against the body of Christ is for Christians to give up on working it out and to start complaining about one another, to start arguing. And so he's going, guys, we're gonna get straight to it. This is a threat that the enemy wants to weaken, but you are not called just for yourself. The world is watching you complain. The world is watching you dispute. The world is watching you gossip about each other, backstab each other, walk away from what God has called you to. He's going, you can't shine in a dark, ugly world if you aren't committed to working it out. Is anybody with me? We're gonna close, but I've got a four-year-old and a two-year-old and they argue by the minute. And I just get sick of it. (laughs) I get tired of it. And you know what I've started to say to them? Don't talk to me anymore. You go work it out. You go work it out together. And some of you need to sit out of your prayer closet and go work it out. You need to go have a conversation. You don't need to walk out. You don't need to bow out. You don't need to peace out. You don't need to make an excuse why you can't Work it out. Don't walk out. Work it out and watch God do a miracle. Because God's waiting for us not just to have an experience in a room. He's waiting for us to walk in unity for the long term, to play the long game, to plant our feet in the soil of a church and say, I'm not just gonna worship with my hands. I'm gonna worship by pouring my life out, by loving, by believing the best. That's the mark of humility. Humility doesn't flash, it shines. Humility is not something you do on Sunday. It's not something that you do once a week. Humility is not something that you do, it's something that you are. It's something that you become. It's my identity in the Lord. God, I wanna be humble, Lord. God, I wanna follow you. I wrote it down in my journal this week. Humility is not a disco ball. It's a lighthouse. 
that your life, this is some mature Christian conversation, okay? I understand like this summer we're, we're going deep into the book of Philippians, but this is maturity, that you would understand that God hasn't put you on this earth just for you. He's put you on this earth to give him glory and then point others to him. So is your life just flashing or is your life shining? Do people see Christ in you? Humility might be our greatest practice for evangelism. Because how many of y'all know, if we don't have humility, our evangelism tactics, they don't matter. We're not going to reach anybody. Some of y'all got to be careful because you wear Vu merch a lot. That's a liability, yo. <laughs> Someone, you know, cuts you off and you got a big Vu shirt on. Ah, spirit fingers, you know, like you got to got to check yourself because God you're you're calling me to shine I don't want to just flash humility's not flashy I don't want a church to be flashy I know I'm using a word right there but you you can read between the lines we're not just hype here we're we're about the hope of Christ we want to shine we want to keep shining on good days and difficult days we want to shine bright with the light of Jesus some of you have been coming to our church. Really, um, September marks seven years. I can't believe it. And um, God's been so faithful. Since the day we started the church, you'll see it all over the place. There's this phrase that says, into the night. Have you seen that before? Anyone, anyone ever seen the end of the night? It's, just, it's one of our mottos. It's one of our cultural phrases. But maybe you wondered, where does that come from? Well, it actually comes right here from Philippians chapter 2 but it comes from the message translation. I just thought today it would be so fitting. As you say, into the night, as you hashtag that on your Instagram, as you wear t-shirts that say, into the night, I hope you know it comes from a heart of humility. It comes from a pathway of humility that leads to joy. And this is what Eugene Peterson says in verse 12. He says, what I'm getting at, friends, is that you should simply keep on doing what you've done from the beginning. When I was living among you, you lived, watch this, in responsive obedience. Now that I'm separated from you, keep it up. Better yet, redouble your efforts. Be energetic in your life of salvation, reverent and sensitive before God. That energy is God's energy, an energy deep within you, God himself willingly and working at what will give him the most pleasure. Paul's writing from this prison. He's been away from this church. Every pastor who goes away from their church, we're always going, yo, keep doing the thing you were doing when I was, when I was present. Now I'm absent. Do it even more. Because the mark of a leader is not what you do in the leader's presence. It's what you do in their absence. Is this thing taking root? Is it real in my life? And he says, do everything readily and cheerfully. No bickering. No second guessing allowed. Go out into the world uncorrupted. A breath of fresh air in this squalid and polluted society. Provide people with a glimpse of good living and of the living God, carry the light-giving message, here it is, into the night, so that I'll have good cause to be proud of you on the day that Christ returns. You'll be living proof that I didn't go to all this work for nothing. What's the mark of humility? How do I get humility? I get humility by receiving and responding to the radical love of God. Jesus, you saved me. You gave me purpose, even from this prison cell, even from this failed marriage, even from this failed business, even from the cancer ward, even in my shame, God, I can rejoice in you. It's not about me. And so, Lord, I empty myself. I don't grab. I'm not not reaching it. I'm emptying myself. God, I'm obedient. I'm not looking for the opportunities. I'm just going to follow you. Lord, I don't want to flash here and there. I want to shine bright in my darkest hours. I close with C.S. Lewis from Mere Christianity, my favorite quote ever from humility. Let it be a full circle moment for all of us. This is where we find our joy today, friends, as believers in Christ. This don't make no sense if you're not a follower of Jesus. But he says this. He says, do not imagine that if you meet a really humble man, he will be what most people call humble nowadays. He will not be sort of greasy, smarmy person who's always telling you that, of course. He is nobody. Probably all you will think about him is that he seemed a cheerful, intelligent chap who took a real interest in what you said to him. If you do dislike him, it will be because you feel a little envious of anyone 
who seems to enjoy life so easily. He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. If I'm gonna enjoy this life the way that Jesus designed it, I gotta forget myself. Yeah. Cross before me, the world behind me. Like Paul, he says in verse 18, I pour my life out like a drink offering. You want joy this summer? Forget yourself. Do you believe it today? Come on, can you give God a big round of applause? Hey, this is Rich and Don Shree Wilkerson, and we want to say thank you so much for watching and engaging with today's content. Maybe today you want to make the decision to follow Jesus. Why don't you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, today I choose to entrust my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a new creation. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're celebrating with you the decision that you've made, and we wanna walk this journey out alongside you. Yeah, and if you just prayed that prayer, why don't you go ahead and follow the prompts that are on the screen right now? We're so glad that you took some time to watch today's message. Do us a favor, if it encouraged you, if it impacted you, go ahead and share this. And if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the Voo Church YouTube channel so you can continue to get more content like this. We love you guys, and we're declaring the best is yet to come. come.